welcome everyone. I'm just going to give everyone a few minutes um, just to filter on into the call. Um, we've got um, a very busy session tonight, which is great. Loads of people registered. Um, so um, welcome everyone. Um, if this is your first time coming to a webinar or you've been to loads, um, welcome either way. Um, so before I hand over to tonight's panellists, I'm just going to click through a couple of um, housekeeping bits and bobs so that you know how to get the most out of the webinar this evening. Um, so if you want to ask a question um, and you've got a direct question that you want to ask to Les, then if you put that into the Q&A box, um, we'll mainly do um, a, a kind of um, big Q&A right at the end, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of similar questions. But if there's anything particularly pertinent that we're picking up at the time, then we'll answer as we go. Um, but for the most part, we're going to um, do a block of presentation and then questions at the end. Um, there is closed captioning tonight, so um, if you do need that, then you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to get access to that. Um, and if you've got any other thoughts or comments, isn't a direct question, um, please feel free to put that into the chat box rather than the Q&A if you've got anything that you want to share, either with the hosts or everyone on the call today, you can do that. Um, Tonight's webinar is being recorded, um, so if you want to watch it back or you've got people in your band who couldn't make it tonight that want to watch it, it will be recorded and will be up in the members resources um, later on this evening, um, so you will be able to watch it back fairly swiftly. Um, that's all from me right now. I'm going to keep it nice and short and sweet. Um, before we hand over to Les, who's delivering um, tonight's session, um, I'm going to hand straight over to Marie Bedford. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Marie Bedford. I'm Finance Trustee and Treasurer for Brass Band England, and also the Treasurer for the European Brass Band Association and for Brass and Concert Championships. Um, so this webinar has come about as a result of BBE's own VAT status, which needed a review, but also due to a VAT error that was identified in the accounts of Brass in Concert. And it led us to wonder if there might be other brass band organisations who would be interested in learning about VAT especially for charities where it can be very quite complicated with a lot of rules. So just to describe the issue that we experienced at Brass in Concert, to give you a feel for things, um, they had applied a correct cultural exemption status on their ticket income, which is normally a battable income, meaning that they could keep all of the income from the ticket sales and not give a portion of that over to HMRC. Um, however, that meant that they could no longer reclaim all the VAT on their expenditure, as they were now a partially exempt organisation for VAT purposes. And what that means is that they were now receiving both VATable and exempt income. So the error meant that Brass in Concert had claimed back too much VAT on their expenditure from HMRC, and we needed to now pay that back to them. And in addition, Brass in Concert was likely to be charged penalties and interest on the debt too. The sum was material to Brass and Constant, though I am pleased to say that we've been able to solve the issue and pay the debts. A lot of charities are in this predicament, making similar mistakes, and it has meant insolvency for some. We don't wish for any of you to experience that kind of worry. Um, so Les Howard is going to take you through some of the basics of VAT tonight. He helped Brass and Constant to identify the error and to navigate the HMRC minefield of declaring and paying the debt. And he's been helping Brass Band England as well with assessing our particular VAT situation, uh, although we don't have any errors as yet because we're not yet registered. Um, I'm not going to kid you, I am an accountant, but I'm not a specialist in VAT, um, and I, VAT is quite a dry subject. But it's really important that we get that right and that you make it work for your organisation because the, the, the consequences of it can be quite serious. So I'm going to hand you over now to Les who, frankly, in the last 12 months has become my best friend. <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Thank you for that welcome, um, Sarah and Marie. I'm going to do the clever Zoom thing. There we go. Right. So, um, so I'm Les Howard, as you know. I'm um, part of a small team of VAT specialists. We're based just outside Cambridge. Uh, and um, we do lots and lots of work with all sorts of charitable organisations uh, uh, and other commercial organisations too, although our focus and my focus for most of my time 
is with charities. So um, you know about questions and answers and, and all, all of that uh, interaction. So without more ado, some VAT basics to start with. Apologies if you know some of this, um, but what we find so often is that people are not very familiar with some of the nuances. So um, some about basics. The first one is this. Everything is vatable unless it's not. That is the um, starting point for all of that situation. Oh, I've just got a note from Sarah. Uh, this time we shared it slides. Sarah, I'm going to unshare and then go back in again and see if that cures our little problem. Apologies. So. Right. I don't want you all to see my notes. You don't need particularly to do that. So. Right. Perhaps, Sarah, you'll put your um, uh, volume on so you can <laughs> tell me if it's working properly. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, well. we're, we're there now. That will all be edited at some point. So, um, lots of common, uh, lots of misconceptions in respect to VAT, um, and particularly with regard to VAT exemptions, so those uh, types of activities where VAT doesn't apply. Um, but the first assumption to make is that everything is vatable, unless it's not, in other words, unless it's explicitly excluded. And we'll look at how that applies um, to some charitable organisations shortly. Um, something else just to be aware of, and that is that the registration threshold is actually quite high at £85,000 a year of taxable income. So for um, quite a lot of charitable organisations, you know, if your turnover is 40, 50,000, you can say, well, actually, I don't need to worry about registering for VAT. So that puts you in a, a position of some certainty. So, so that's worth being aware of. Um, and in addition, if you've got donation income, and I hope you have, the donations don't count towards that registration threshold. So you might have you know, £100,000 worth of donations income, but you ignore them when you're deciding or asking the question whether you need to register um, for VAT or not. Um, but another problem the other way is that if you sell tickets um, and there's some sort of agency involved, whether there's a, um, a venue that takes a cut or somebody else that takes a cut, the gross ticket income is treated as income, not the net receipts. So again, if you're asking the VAT registration question, you'd need to, to um, add back those deductions to the value of your income. But as a result, as we've said, many organizations don't need to worry about registering for VAT, but I guess you're on this course um, because you're thinking about that. So um, perhaps you are round about that registration threshold. So what about the choice of becoming registered for VAT if your taxable turnover were below the threshold? And again, we find this quite commonly. Um, sometimes it works okay, but sometimes it doesn't. And in actual fact, sometimes it is a total disaster. So do be careful. Don't, don't rush into registering for VAT if you don't need to. The first... Um, condition for registering for VAT if your turnover is below the threshold is that you are in business. In other words, you are making a charge for something. Somebody comes to an event, you know, they receive a supply of uh, what's called cultural services. That is a business activity. Perhaps you sell merchandise, catering, all those are business activities. However, it may be that that income is exempt, not taxable. So if, if the income is taxable, then it counts towards the 85,000 pound threshold. 
If it's exempt, it doesn't. And again, we'll look at uh, cultural events where, where they can fall either side of that line. Um, so should you register for VAT voluntarily, think about the cost of administration. Somebody has to keep the record, somebody has to submit back returns, etc. So there is a cost to that. It may not be huge, but it is a cost. And the main reason people register for that is that they're going to expect to recover some VAT. So again, just you know, scrap of paper, how much is it going to cost you to administer your VAT registration? How much fat are you likely to recover? Um, rule of thumb, you know, finger in the air um, and think about that. And just to make matters worse and more complex, not all the VAT you incur is recoverable. As Marie mentioned at the start, um, if you're partially exempt, you can only recover a portion of the VAT uh, that, you, that you incur. And even the calculation of that can be quite complex and time consuming. So do think about all those things. I would say be cautious about registering unless you have to. That would be my starting point for any charity, not just charities um, that are part of BBE. So we're going to look at six complex issues. Um, I'm not going to try and turn you into VAT consultants in the next hour, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but just to highlight these issues, and then we'll dig a little bit into each of them. Um, they are the issues that we, we have been finding, um, again, not just with BBE members, but with other charities, certainly other cultural services charities. Um, so the first one is who is doing what? So we'll look at things like agency and principal supplies. <coughs> Excuse me. The next question is grants. What is a grant income? When does it count towards your registration threshold? When doesn't it count? The next one is sponsorship. What that involves, and again, how that is accounted for for VAT purposes. Membership subscriptions. This is actually quite a complex area. Um, so uh, let's say we'll, we'll look at that very briefly. Cultural services, that's uh, delivering um, your music or your entertainment uh, in whatever uh, context that is delivered. And then finally, training and education. Um, quite a few bands that we've come across uh, operate some sort of training scheme, often for younger people. Uh, and if a charge is made for that, how does that, how does that all work? So let's del drill down into some of those um, complex areas. So the first one is who is doing what? Now, VAT is a tax on a supply. So if you're carrying out an event and you are the performer or the performers, there might be a promoter for the event, there'll be a venue, hopefully there'll be an audience. That's four parties potentially in one transaction. So where is the money going? Where are the supplies going between those parties? Um, there are a number of different potential scenarios there. Now, the thing just to be careful of, that if you follow the money trail, it can lead you to the wrong VAT conclusions. VAT is a tax on a supply, not a tax on money. So to get the, the VAT correct, you have to unpick the contractual obligations and contractual agreements um, between the parties. And hopefully the money will fit in with that. But that is quite complex. Um, it's a goldmine for lawyers, um, because there's lots of arguments to be made uh, in that respect. Some of you will have heard of Uber, the taxi people. They are about to start charging VAT on their taxi hiring charges. And it's exactly because of the same question. Um, but they, it's de decided that they are the principal, not the agent for their supply. Um, and uh, that's one of the factors that has to be taken into account. Um, but given that there are potentially four parties involved, the contracts would not be the whole picture. A court of law would look at the contracts, but would also ask what is actually going on in practice. And it might need to review uh, those contracts. So, um, you know, if you are involved in uh, these sorts of arrangements, it's worth just having a little 
think through how the contracts are drafted, who you are contracting with, um, etc. So lots of permutations, um, and you're probably more familiar with them um, than I am. Um, but uh, it, it is a complex area. And when we look at cu cultural exemptions, the cultural exemption and the uh, cu sorry, the cultural exemption will depend on the status of the provider. So if the performer is providing a cultural service, that may be exempt. If a promoter or a venue is providing it, that may mean that exemption doesn't apply. And that's why we'd have to look into the contractual situation uh, to see if that would work. And can we change it? We, is there going to be a better out, that outcome if we change that contractual situation? The next one is grants. Um, there we are. So a little bit of legislation there. Um, VAT Act 1994 is the, the main piece of that legislation that still applies. And what it says is that supply, <coughs> excuse me, includes all forms of supply, but not anything done otherwise than for a consideration. So a bit of a double negative in that. Um, but essentially VAT applies to a supply subject to exemptions, which we'll look at. So if there's no supply, there can be no VAT. So in other words, if you do something for money, then that's in, in, in legal speak, that's called a direct link. But if you're given a grant and there is no such link, then no VAT applies. Now, the difficulty there is how do we determine if we're the recipient of a grant? Is that money for doing something or is it you know, essentially um, without strings? And HMRC have provided guidance. So that screenshots of the two sections of guidance on the HMRC website. The first column is the factors that point uh, in the direction of it being a supply. The second column factors that point towards it not being a supply. Now, in the first column, there are nine different factors. In the second column, there are 10. So in other words, there are 19 different questions that a charity particularly would have to ask in relation to each grant it receives. So that's quite a lot of work. Now, Marie, bless her, did that uh, for one of the organizations we're working with and, uh, and carefully worked through. But that's quite a long, piece of work. Um, but that is the, the guidance that we would do as a firm uh, routinely to decide whether a grant is a grant or whether it's what's called consideration for supply. Just because the first uh, word on a contract says grant doesn't mean that the substance of that means it is a grant. So you have to unpick um, what is actually uh, going on. And again, I'm afraid it's a big subject. It's potentially very, very complex. There is lots of litigation over the years. Um, and, you know, to unpick all of that is quite a large piece of work. So that guidance is quite helpful. If you were to Google HMRC and um, either of those two uh, references that are ringed, VAT SC 06. 317 and 6318 would take you direct to that guidance. So you're very welcome to have a look at it um, uh, and read it through. But as I say, that is quite complex, but it is significant because if your income is, is, is a grant, then you exclude it from the value of taxable supplies. If your income isn't a grant and it's consideration for a supply, then it goes into the 85,000 pound uh, calculation. So that can be make a big difference um, either way. So something to be aware of. The next one <coughs> is a little bit easier, I think, and that's sponsorship. Um, in most cases, uh, in up to our observation, 
a sponsor receives something for the money they give. Now, usually what they receive is of lower value than what they give because they want to sponsor, they want to be generous towards the organization. But as long as something is received in return, then it's, uh, it's consideration for a supplier. So for instance, um, advertising uh, of an event, uh, a specific number of seats at an event. Um, it might be that you have um, a, a tiered sponsorship arrangement, a bronze, silver, gold uh, arrangement. Um, you might have links on your website uh, to feature your sponsors. All of that is um, supplies for that consideration. So in most cases, um, we would assume that sponsorship is valuable. May not be, but that would be our starting point. Now, if it's a corporate sponsor, and many are, then they can recover VAT anyway. So if you were VAT registered, you've got a corporate sponsor, you, you know, it, the charge is £10,000 or whatever, plus VAT, and they can recover it. Obviously, you simply issue a VAT uh, invoice to do that. So just make sure you can issue a VAT invoice uh, from your accounting system. The next one is membership. Um, what we found is a lot of um, cultural services organizations do have a membership scheme of some sort. Um, now, there is a VAT exemption for uh, membership subscriptions, but it's actually quite narrow. Um, oddly, there's four categories, but it's still quite narrow. Um, so just for completeness, the first those two there, professional associations and learned societies, those relate to members' employment. Um, so that is not going to apply to a, an amateur um, music group. Third one is a representative trade association. And again, it's that's relating to people's business activities. And then it falls into, um, sorry, let me bring that up. My mistake. So of, of those four options there, um, professional associations, learner societies, that relates to members' employment. The third one um, relates to uh, persons with shared interests, uh, particularly in business. And only possibly would the fourth category refer to some sort of uh, cultural musical activity. It's a sort of catch-all provision. Um, but certainly our, our analysis of a number of BBE members suggests that it's actually quite rare um, that, that any BBE member would be able to be, uh, would qualify for exemption. All those phrases sound quite helpful. You know, is it a philanthropic, is it a civic activity? Um, but um, our understanding of the legislation is that that's not gonna to apply to um, a group. If you wanted to talk to me specifically about that, we can uh, we can do so if that would be helpful. So because membership subscriptions will not be exempt, they will default to being taxable. Now, just to make life even more complicated, a member will re usually receive a package of benefits for their membership subscription. Um, and hopefully they can be identified and ideally they can be valued in some way. Now we said that in principle everything is vatable um, but it may be that there's some elements of um, the members benefits that are VAT exempt and the particular one we've come across uh, is insurance which is an obvious um, exempt supply and what that means is if we're looking at a membership subscription Part of it will be taxable, part of it will be exempt. And in some cases, again, we've noticed there's a separate part that may be a donation. So it may be that members give a, um, a, a contribution that is just directed uh, elsewhere, um, in which case, again, that needs to go in, into a calculation. So if we're looking at an apportionment calculation, there's a good reason for that. And that is if we treated everything as taxable, it goes towards our £85,000 threshold, and it may not be in our interest to be registered. If we apportion subscription, 
even if we're not yet that registered, the value of taxable supplies is less, and therefore we can defer having to register the VAT. So a little worked example, um, and this is based very, very loosely on, uh, on an organization we did some work with. So we've got um, 150,000 pounds a year of, um, sorry, <laughs> go back. Um, I've got membership income there of 120,000 pounds a year, grant income of 100,000 and taxable, say merchandise of 30,000. Now, if we treated the whole of that membership income as taxable, we'd add that to the merchandise income, which is also taxable. And that brings us to 150,000 pounds of taxable income. We would therefore be required to be registered for the AT. Now, it may be that we feel we, you know, that would not be in our interest to do so. Um, so that will be a, you know, that will be a cost to the organisation. However, if we were able to apportion um, the membership income in some way, and I've just done a simple um, one, uh, one third taxable, two thirds exempt. So in other words, only 40,000 the membership income would count towards taxable turnover. So the taxable turnover is reduced to 70,000 pounds instead of 150,000. So that means that that organization would defer its liability to register. Now, what we would recommend is that that apportionment uh, be reviewed, perhaps every year or two, um, just to make sure it, it was still correct. It might be that you've, you change um, the benefits package, it might be that members, you know, what members receive changes from time to time. So that will be, um, be worth reviewing from time to time. I wouldn't say you have to do it every year, but certainly every two or three years, um, I would recommend. Right, the fifth complicated area is cultural services. Um, the legislation says cultural services are theatrical, musical, or choreo choreographic performance of a cultural nature. Uh, and actually that's very broad, and customers accept that's very broad. Um, the guidance says uh, live performances of a stage play, dancing, etc., are considered to be cultural and therefore they will qualify for exemption. And I think most BBE groups would fall within that. You're delivering a, a musical performance. And there's a but, I'm afraid, and it's a bit of a big but, and that is this. Cultural services are only exempt when they're provided by an eligible body. Now, there is a threefold test for whether an organization is an eligible body. So the first one, and this is straight from the legislation, um, the organization is a charity or other nonprofit. And its constitution or other governing document precludes distribution precludes the making of and the distribution of profits so there has to be proper wording suitable wording in the constitution um, the next condition is that the profits are ring fenced so the profits may be generated from particular activities but they have to be ring fenced for those same activities so if a charity were to to have cultural services and education for instance it couldn't subsidize one activity from the other from, from the other and remain exempt and that makes it quite complex and then thirdly it has to be administered and managed and managed, managed and administered essentially on a voluntary basis um, the way i would look at that is are the decision makers paid or not decision makers are paid uh, it's unlikely to meet that test. Decision makers are voluntary, then it probably will meet that test. So um, that is the uh, legislation and the guidance. So you could look that up if you want to. Um, now, again, our rule of thumb is that a voluntary uh, amateur music group probably would be a, an eligible body. Um, but I think we'd always want to just double check that. Um, one of our little favorite sayings in the VAT world is assume nothing. 
Um, so although I would start with that, leaning towards that, I'd want to satisfy myself that, that an organisation was exempt. If necessary, um, we would just recommend changes to constitutions. Um, we're quite comfortable in, in doing that, running them past your uh, legal advisors as well. Um, but that can be helpful. For some organisations, interestingly, we change the constitution so you fall outside of the exemption. And in one or two situations we've come across, that's actually been quite helpful. Now, the next one is educational training. Um, and again, it's quite broad. So any course, class or lesson instruction in any subject is education. So if you're training people uh, in uh, musical technique, uh, et cetera, then that would fall within education. But there is another but. And that is this. Oops. For education activities to fall within the exemption, they must be delivered by an eligible body. Now, to make it more complicated, the definition of eligible body for an education provider is not the same as for a cultural services provider. It may be that one organization meets both criteria, um, but you'd have to make sure you have to go through the, the details. So for um, an education eligible body, um, the first test is that it is precluded from distributing and doesn't distribute any profit. That's quite common uh, with charities. The second bullet is a bit more complex. Um, and that's that any surpluses that are made from education activities are ring fenced for the continuation or improvement of those services. And that policy has to be applied in practice. Customs are quite strict um, on that. And again, it may be that it would suit you to, um, to have vatable education rather than exempt education. And again, we've come across that. Um, but that does make it quite difficult for a small organization. Are we an eligible body for cultural services? Or are we an eligible body for education services? So given that, there are six complex areas. What can possibly go wrong? Um, and unfortunately, there is quite a lot, joking aside. Um, the first one is this, and that is that input tax, so VAT on purchases, can be overclaimed. Um, and we've seen a number of charities, and that includes providers of cultural services, uh, where this has happened. Um, customs can go back up to four years, and we've seen several substantial assessments where um, organisations have overclaimed VAT for all or almost all of that four years, and that sum can be very, very substantial. The next thing that can go wrong is that output tax is underpaid. Um, now, again, you know, uh, charity trustees may assume, oh, we're a charity, we don't need to charge and pay VAT. That's quite a common misconception. Um, but you know, it's not, again, that is a misconception, and it may well be that there is a substantial and persistent um, underpayment of VAT. Now, Obviously, if your clients were all corporates, you could just send them VAT invoices, and hopefully they're still around and they pay them. Um, but for many charities, their clients are not corporates. They're private individuals or other charities, and you can't go sending them VAT only invoices. Um, so you're stuck having to pay uh, underpaid output tax from your reserves. Um, another little detail, um, we came across this quite recently, um, actually with a BBE member. If you were to decide, oh, I'll, I'll deregister for VAT, and that will get me out of all these problems. If you have, on the date of deregistration, any assets on which you've claimed VAT, you are deemed to have sold those assets. Now, one organisation had... Um, musical instruments to the value of over 100,000 pounds. 
So the deemed supply, uh, the VAT on the deemed supply was 20% of more than £100,000. That's a huge sum of money. So that creates an output tax charge. That VAT has to be accounted for at the time of deregistration. It's treated as under, underpaid output tax. So again, that's a, often a hidden thing. Uh, and people don't spot that or they don't spot it until it's too late. Um, so that, as you can imagine, can be a nasty surprise. What else can go wrong? VAT registration can be backdated. Now, there is no um, statute of limitations for that. HMRC can backdate as long as they like. The record that I've seen is 18 years. Um, so you can only guess how much VAT. Um, who's due for that organisation. And on top of all of those output tax and input tax errors, there is penalties and interest. Um, sorry, the next slide, I was going to talk to you about those. I will tell you because they, um, that come up, comes up on this slide. So, Having found out that there's a VAT debt and there's perhaps penalties and interest applying, at some point we'd have to talk to HMRC. Um, one of the problems we've found at the moment is that they are very, very slow. Um, two and a bit years ago, a lot of their staff um, were reallocated to Brexit work. Then they were reallocated to um, the COVID uh, grant schemes. So day-to-day -day VAT work, um, it's been massively delayed. So we're looking at delays, in some cases three to six months, in some cases longer than that. Um, so that adds stress, without doubt. Interest, if there's money owed to HMRC, interest will apply, and that is 2.5% above base rate. Now, base rate is increasing. Base rates have been very low for a number of years, which is fine but they're starting to go up. So in the future, this is going to start to be quite expensive. Penalties for careless behaviour, and, and that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, um, excuse me, we're not talking about deliberate behaviour, so we're talking about careless behaviour. The penalty is up to 30% of the VAT due. So again, that's going to be very, very substantial. Now, um, we can argue for mitigation, we can argue for what's called suspension. Um, and obviously that will always help. Um, but 30% is the starting point. And quite frankly, dealing with HMRC, even at the best of times, is stressful. There is time and there is cost. Um, dealing with their letters, dealing with their delays, um, trying to almost translate their letters into sensible English, all of that. Uh, is quite difficult. Um, and uh, there's a little picture, if you remember, of Hector, who was in HMRC's promotion a few years ago. Ideally, um, any VAT problems we want to sort out without Hector on our shoulder. We want to sort out in our to our time frame. Because once Hector is on the on the job, it actually gets more stressful. So we want to try and keep control of that process. Uh, as far as possible. And just in closing, a real life case study. Now, this is a provider of cultural services. It's not a BBE member, it's not within the brass bands sector, um, but it is an organization uh, in the musical sector. Uh, and so it was a client of mine a few years ago. Um, it was a provider of cultural services. Um, around, well, you can guess around 20 years ago, it put in a claim for overpaid output tax. So when it started, it accounted for output tax on its activities. Um, so put a claim in. Um, as before we got involved, that was £21,000, covered that period up to £2,000. However, and this is where the problem arose, it continued to claim input tax thereafter. And year after year, it just claimed a chunk of input tax on its activities. Um, interestingly, when the um, director sent 
me the assessment, which amounted to £36,000. The title of the file was called VAT damage. Um, and that's what it was. That was the damage um, to their balance sheet. Um, once they added on penalties and interest, that was over £40,000 in uh, in debt to HMRC. Now I looked at their accounts online and I noticed that their debts went up in that year from 25,000 to 71,000. Um, and basically they were nearly closed down. In actual fact, a trustee who was quite wealthy um, basically bailed them out. Otherwise they would have closed the doors and they would have simply had to stop trading. So it's, you know, I don't want to bring scare stories, but the real reality is, and I think Marie mentioned it in, uh, in opening, the worst case scenario is that, you know, charities just can get closed down simply because they get the VAT wrong, totally inadvertently. Um, so we're hoping that won't happen uh, with you, but hopefully if there are issues, we can um, assist. So... Thank you for listening. I'm now going to bring up the Q&A and the chat. Um, and I think, Sarah, if I unshare, is that the best thing to do? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yes. Um, so anyone, if you've got any questions, now is the time um, to get them in. So just pop them into the Q&A and we'll be okay. able to do Right. I've got one question straight away. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry that came me very early as me learning this, um, this very clever software. I'll read Robert's question and I can, um, uh, I can answer that. So Robert's question is this. Your band is below the 85,000 threshold, not registered for that. At a registered charity, can that be reclaimed on things like adverts or hire of equipment? Um, the answer is no, you can't reclaim um, VAT, and that's because you're not registered. However, just a reference to adverts, now the supply of adverts to charities should normally be zero rated. So go back to your whoever you're advertising with, if it's a local newspaper, and say, well, this should be zero rated. Um, and I've come across situations where local newspapers have a charitable certificate, um, just to confirm that, that that can be zero rated. Usually all they need is a charity number. Um, so that is definitely something worth, um, worth looking at. Um, perhaps we'll put something together, Marie, on advertising you, you your eyes lit up <laughs> we did that but yes if you're if you're a charity irrespective of whether you're that registered you can you um advertising charge to you should be zero rated not standard rated so i hope that's okay robert i hope that makes um, some sense there and no open questions no, no more in at the moment. So now's your time. You'll miss your chance to have your question asked if you don't put it in now. <laughs> have a little map of my, my drink. We have had another one in from David. Okay. Right, David, what is the VAT treatment of donations or the donation portion of membership? Now, a donation is what's called outside the scope of VAT. Um, so that means there's no VAT chargeable on it. It doesn't count towards the VAT registration threshold. Now, a donation to be a donation has to be voluntary. So, for instance, if your membership subscription included a obligatory donation, that isn't a donation. So the member has to have the option not to donate. Otherwise, it's not a donation. So you need wording, you know, suitable wording somewhere in your um renewal documentation whatever it might be um you know so you can say you know for instance our membership subscription this year is 15 pounds it includes an optional donation of three pounds please tick this box if you don't wish to donate so you can put words in like that that's absolutely fine um, but there does need to be option um, not to do that 
Um, is there anything else that's zero rated for a registered charity? Um, there is certain costs relating to premises. So if you own your premises, and actually one BBE member we're dealing with does own their premises, um, works in relation to accessibility. So things like wheelchair ramps, disabled toilets can be zero rated. Um, I'm doing some work for it's a church in, in Cambridge, near where I live, and they're spending a large sum of money on accessibility works. So we've, um, we're trawling through the schedule of works from the contractor, and we've identified those parts that are eligible for zero rating. We will give a note, brief note to the contractor so they understand why it's properly zero rated. So that would be worth um, having a look at. And if you're a larger organisation, if you had your own building built for you, that could be zero rated. Um, I don't know how common that is uh, with members. Um, uh, Paul's question, do you have any examples of what was considered a benefit for a membership member who is subscribing? Um, it, it varies. Some, have, some are in receipt of a periodic news email. Um, some pay, uh, we've seen some groups where they rent uh, instruments or they pay a um, contribution towards the maintenance of instruments. Um, others may get uh, discounts for um, other supplies. So there's a whole range of, of different benefits um, within, the, um, within the membership subscription. Now, of course, not every member will choose to buy into all those benefits, but the fact that the benefits are available is the test. So it may be that, you know, only a proportion of members um, receive certain benefits, but as long as they're available, they're part of the membership um, subscription. So, just try, I'm, trawling i'm not trawling through in sequence now sarah i'm afraid just to keep you on your toes okay, that's okay. So, <laughs> john uh zero rated advertising may apply to other supplies um maybe a list of typical band supplies like that i've also paid VAT on advertising now if you've already paid vat on advertising why don't you ask the provider whether they will refund that i don't know that they're obliged to do so but it's good PR for them. And all they would do is adjust the VAT on the um, on their VAT return. Um, somebody spent a uh, bill. Uh, we spent money on buildings, grant, insulation, lighting, heating, etc. I'm sorry, that is all standard rated bill. I'm a little sorry on that. If you're VAT registered, um, then there's a proportion that could be claimed depending on your VAT registered VAT status. Uh, Bill, sorry, I missed your previous question. I'm in the wrong sequence. My band uh, pre COVID had an annual turnover of between five and seven K. During COVID, with a buildings grant of 30K and two COVID relief grants. So um, those COVID relief grants do not constitute taxable uh, income. So they don't count towards the 85,000 pound threshold. Um, so, um, and they also you know, don't affect your recoverability of input tax. I wonder, Bill, are you VAT registered? Probably that would help me answer that question better. Perhaps you can come back to me on that, Bill. Paul's question. Uh, rental of a rehearsal space is a benefit of membership. If that if that is included as a benefit of membership, then presumably it would be. Um, Robert's question: Did I understand you to say that if you're having a band room built, that it could be zero rated? What do you mean by that? Now, um, the answer is yes, but it depends. Um, 
So for a registered charity, if, they, if a new building is constructed for a charity for its charitable activities, then that is zero rated. Now, if you have, um, if you were to use the band room for performances for which you charged, that is a business activity that would preclude zero rating. Um, but if, if, if the building generated no revenue, then that can be zero rated. That is worth looking at. So if any member wants to buy a new building or build a new building, zero rating is definitely worth having a look at. Because if you're exempt or not that registered, you can't recover that on a building. So let's see if we can zero rate them. Um, so that is worth coming down. And while we're on buildings, Jenny's question. Uh, we have our own building which is falling down literally. So we're fundraising for New Hall. The, the quotes have all been plus fat, but we're a registered charity, not that registered and nowhere near the threshold. Right. So Jenny, if you were to demolish the existing building and have a new one built, then you're looking at zero rating. If you have it repaired, you can't. So let's see, um, you know, let's check those quotes. Are those quotes for repair or are they of de demolition and rebuild? And um, please feel free to come back to me personally on that, Jenny. Um, that's got to be worth you not paying VAT on. Um, so, Bill, you're not that registered. Just going back to your question. I'm just going to try and find Bill's question. Uh, there we go. So you're not that re registered. So, um, Bill, you're spending money on your building, lighting, heating, etc. Um, you're not that registered, therefore you're stuck with that, that VAT, I'm afraid. Um, I'm hoping that some of your COVID grants will have at least part covered that. Um, David's question, can you give some examples of non-taxable benefits that could constitute part of membership? Um, David, the most common one we've come across is, as I mentioned, is insurance. Um, it may be if you have, if your members automatically become members of BBE or making music, for instance, then that would also probably be an exempt, a non-taxable benefit. Um, but everything's vatable unless, unless it's not. So most benefits are vatable. That's how the rules, that's how that works, unfortunately. Um, so... Um, there tend not to be many non-taxable benefits, but if, if they are available, do you want to, uh, to make use of those? Um, I'm jumping down to Stephen's question. Apologies to Greg, I am going to come back to you. Um, Stephen, our charity own our own premises or in the process of adding an extension. We do not hold concerts there, but we have a small amount of income from other organisations renting. Additionally, a large amount of capital expenditure on new instruments is to be made. The turnover is about 40,000. Would we be able to register voluntarily? Um, there's a number of variables in that, Stephen. Um, it, I'm actually doing a seminar for another charitable group shortly. Not tonight, obviously. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sort of defaulting to say, if you were to register get the VAT back on their extension and then deregister, that can create problems. Um, so I'm, I'm always cautious about that. Um, one of the problems is that customs would not be obliged to deregister you. Um, so you end up being stuck with being registered, paying back all the VAT over years that you thought you claimed back. So it would be worth crunching some numbers, Stephen. Um, whether that is doable. Um, an extension is usually vatable. On occasions, it can be zero rated, but actually that's, that's um, less common. Um, certainly if you're holding events there, and you, sorry, if you're renting to third parties, then that would be the, the construction of the extension would be uh, taxable. Um, it would be worth looking at, Stephen, but I 
suspect you would be unable to deregister later. Um, so um, crunch some numbers with me, Stephen, on that. That might be the best way to, to look at that. Back to Jenny. Total demolition and rebuild. Um, okay. Um, we'll be looking to rent the hall out. Now, um, normally, if you rent the hall, that does preclude um, zero rating. However, if the rental were to be in like a village hall or a community centre, so it's used for essentially community and charitable activities, that is deemed to be non-business. So again, that might be worth us looking at, Jenny. For that of 200,000, that has to be worth exploring. Um, so um, Jenny, I'm very happy to take emails directly um, later and we can have conversations. Initial conversations with any members are not going to be chargeable. Um, if we do make a charge, we'll, we'll give you a fee quote before we get it. So, um, okay. Ah, Greg's question, sorry. Um, our band has have our own band hall on council land, which we lease. We're looking to demolish and rebuild our current hall. Um, as a charity, could we build a zero rate? Well, yes, you would, assuming that you're not making a charge to members to use it. Um, so that should be zero rated. Just on zero rating on new builds, because um, we've had two or three questions on that. As a charity, you would give a certificate to the contractor, which declares your eligibility for zero rating. That is in notice, HMRC notice 708 or email me and we'll send you a template. Um, um, that is a legal requirement. So please make sure if you do your own building, do have a building, make sure you do a zero rate certificate. Um, okay, Greg, the, the band Jenny is asking about hire the hall to other community groups to generate income for the band. Definitely a complete rebuild. Um, okay, if you're hiring out if the only sorts of organizations you're hiring the building out to are other bands, that will preclude you from getting zero rating. Now, for the sake of £200,000, surely it's worth thinking about that arrangement. So, for instance, would you make it available to those bands free of charge? Or would you make the uh, building available to other community groups? Um, those are questions we would perhaps want to have a look at, Greg and Jenny. Um, and um, I, I just tend to think if there's a way of getting £200,000 back, it has to be worth finding if there's any options there. Um, obviously, without doing anything grey, um, but, but that would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, I've got one anonymous. Um, what happens to VAT that venues charge on tickets they sell on behalf of a group hiring the venue? Um, I'm not quite sure whether that's a ven that's whether they're charging the group. I think they are charging the group in that question. Um, if a venue, excuse me, if a venue charge VAT um, on those tickets, they just have to account for that on, on the venue's fat return. Um, and if the group is not registered, then the group is just stuck with that. So if it's £120 higher charge instead of 100, it's just a 20% higher, higher, higher charge, if that makes sense. Um, Bill's question. Um, did I hear you suggest that we could ask a building contractor to donate the VAT they charged back to us and they could adjust their VAT return to account for this? Um, no, that's that's not, that, sorry, that's me not making it very clear, but, uh, Bill. If you've got a new build, the contractor will zero rate subject to you meeting the conditions and providing a certificate. 
So there's no VAT charge. Now the contractor will still claim VAT on their subcontractors' fees and on any materials they purchase. Um, I mean, a contractor, if they wanted to, they could donate the VAT. I'm not sure many building contractors make 20% margin, but I suppose they could do it. Um, I think you just have to be careful, Bill, if you have a donation agreement, is it a donation? Um, is that what it is? Um, can the contractor offset the donation against corporation tax? Not, not my, not my tax, but um, I would think, I think it is the company. You know, VatAdvice.org is a is a limited company. We make charitable donations every Christmas. They get goes on our P and L. So, as far as I understand, it's it's allowable. Um, so, um, I hope that's helpful. Um, I can see something in the chat, Sarah. No, that's all right. And that one's been put in the Q&A, so don't okay, worry. That's okay, that's going on. I think that's all the questions that we've got in. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, was a, <laughs> um, that was a busy one. They've got, um, oh, sorry, that one final clarification that's that's just come through on there. Okay, on, on anonymous, okay. On the venue tickets, I mean, is that charged, that if charged by a venue ticket office on behalf of our... Ah, so anonymous... This is back to my starting point about who is doing what for whom. Remember my little graphic? Um, let me pull it up. I, I might be able to do that. Can I do that? I'm going to try and pull up the graphic. Um, Perhaps Sarah, you'll tell me when you can see this graphic. Yep, see that screen share. Okay, so that's the, the, the little, that's one of the scenarios in there. So we've got a promoter, we've got a performer, a venue and an audience. So in this situation, we've got um, the performer is, if you like, charging the venue. And then the venue is charging the audience. And um, if the venue is not an eligible part, body, it will charge the audience VAT uh, via the ticket office. But if the performer is an eligible body and its customer is the venue and not the audience, then the performer's income is VAT exempt. So, you know, the VAT, the VAT then is lost. Now, it may be that the venue is acting as promoter, um, in which case um, you need to check the contractual arrangements as to, you know, you know if, so if the performer is delivering the concert to the audience and the performer is an eligible body, that should be ex exempt and the venue shouldn't charge VAT on the whole amount. Um, and then just to make it more complicated, you can have joint events, performer and venue, um, as a sort of profit share, which is um, not what you want, really, because that just makes it more complicated. So, sorry, Anonymous, it's um, it perhaps wants unpicking a little bit. Um, it's the contractual arrangement that determines how much the performer and how much the venue keep. Um, and then the, the VAT issue will follow from that. So I hope that's given you a steer, uh, Anonymous, but that is one of those complex areas, I'm afraid. I'm just going to unshare that. That's it. And just go back, back to Robert's question. Um, can VAT be zeroed on insurance? No, it can't. Insurance is exempt, whatever, um, not zero rated. But you shouldn't pay VAT on insurance fees. You will pay insurance premium tax, IPT, which for most insurances is at four or five percent. I think it's not, 
it's only at 20 percent on certain types of insurance um, like car warranties and certain holiday products i think um, so if you're charged any rate of tax on insurance that looks like 20 percent go back to your insurer or your broker and have a word with them and say um, um les says that he's not convinced please don't tell them that les says it's wrong because it might be right I'll just put my email address in the chat um, so um please don't expect an answer tomorrow it's my <laughs> wedding anniversary tomorrow so um i'm not be around um but i should be working on um on wednesday and thursday but i do some work eventually um so i'm just checking my laptop so Brilliant. Thanks so much, Les. Um, and thank you for all your questions, everyone. They've been really interesting and, and, and really varied. Um, I'll make sure that the um, Les's email goes out in, in the follow up um, email after the session as well. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we'll put um, the recording of the session and um, um, and, and the PDF to slides in the members resources area. So for, uh, I know there are some non-members on tonight, but if you are a member, um, then you can access all, all the kind of bank of resources um, when you go on there and you can find them. Um, it'd also be really great if you could help us out by um, filling out our evaluation form. Um, so I've, I've put that, I'll put that into the chat now. And um, if you want to fill it out before you leave um, the session, that, and then make sure you click on that. Um, before we finish up so you can fill that out but that'll also go out in the email um, after the session as well. Um, Marie anything that you wanted to finish up on? Uh, there is another question just coming actually. Oh. Nice. Oh. Keen. <laughs> Can't see that. Right. So I'll read it out. It says, if the promoter is the band and not VAT rated, they have a higher agreement with the venue, then ticket income is not VAT rated, even if it goes through their box office? Question mark. Okay. Yes, I've got it now. Um, okay. Um, Yes, that that um, Neil, that that should be doable. Um, the venue is acting as agent for the band, which is the promoter, um, and then they are collecting the ticket receipts on behalf of the band. Now, the venues services might be vatable they might charge you a vatable commission at a certain percent i guess or a fat you know, a flat fee sometimes um but if the promoter again it's back to supply who's doing what and for whom if the band is delivering the concert to the audience as a matter of contract then um, assuming it's an eligible body which which you said it is then that is fat exempt. Um, the involvement of the venue doesn't affect that. Um, so that should be what happens. Um, I can't say that every venue I've come across has been quite so helpful. Um, I have seen I have seen some venues assume that they are always the principal and not the agent. So do be careful of the charitable things. Good. Thanks, Neil. Uh, I hope it's helpful. Um, I'm afraid it is complicated. Um, VAT came in to the UK on first April Fool's Day, 1973, and the <laughs> Chancellor said it's a simple tax. And he was poss possibly right then. It's not right today. Um, so there you go. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Les. I'm just putting yeah, one last you. link into the chat, which is uh, an upcoming webinar that we've got in May, um, which for people who are interested in fundraising, which lots of you on the call tonight will be, um, it's around how to write your case for support. Um, so again, that one's free for members um, and £10 for non-members. So if you're not a member already, then I don't know, 
why you wouldn't be <laughs> so if you're not then make sure that you go um, and sign up for membership because it's well worth it um brilliant thanks so much everyone um and thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for all the questions um les's email is in the chat so if you do have any follow-ups that you would um like to speak to him about please do drop him an email thanks a lot everyone see you soon okay.